Hello friends and welcome to this week's episode of Grits and the Gospel. My name is Reverend Katie Griffiths and I am so thankful to be here with you today. Um, if um, you thought maybe I should have said something on Sunday about all that is going on in the world about the hurricane and about the um, chemical fire in Atlanta and all the other things we have happening in this world, just know that I record these early in the week before any of that happened. This was already uploaded, um, but I hope, my hope and prayer is that you are, first of all, safe and that you have felt the prayers and the love that I have been sending. Um, the chemical fire has directly affected my little community not in the same way that it has affected Rockdale County, but it certainly um, has smelled like a pool here in my community. And so it is my hope that you um, are safe wherever you are, that if you are, your homes and neighborhoods and communities were impacted by the hurricane, that you um, are getting the help you need and that you can see God's light shining through the darkness. And um, so our prayers are continuing um, for all of those who have been affected by all of the storms and the um, natural and not so natural disasters that we have been um, dealing with here in the South. As we come together today on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost, let us continue to remember that God's light, even though sometimes it's the only light, God's light shines brightly in the darkness. The Lord be with you and also with you. Psalm 26 gives us hope when we do the work to separate ourselves from those who do harm to us. It is hopeful and redeeming. Hear now the words of the psalmist. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty. Those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great con congregation, I will bless the Lord. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us join together in the words of affirmation of our faith and belief. Friends, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord of hope and of joy, 
Dear Lord, who is the comfort for those who weep, we come to you now humbled by the immense power and majesty that you have to cover all of our life's moments with your love. Be with us as we move through this time together. Hear us now as we pray those words that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mary Oliver is one of my favorite poets. And I bring to you today her poem, The Journey. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began to the voices around you, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Through the whole house, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, through their mel- though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones, but little by little, as you left as you left their voice behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own that kept you company as you stole deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do. The only thing you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. Today is one of those days when I'm most challenged by scripture. It is one of those days when I wish I had not challenged myself to preach through the lectionary. But these days are always the ones where I see God in new and beautiful ways. So I will do my best to look at the scripture in the way we do all scripture, with a historical lens, with a critical lens, and mainly with a godly lens. When I'm writing my sermons and planning our worship, I often use several different resources for inspiration and background knowledge. This passage on divorce and the same one from Matthew 5 are very scarce in the resource department. Websites and commentaries skip right over the part of the passage that sees Jesus talking about divorce and goes straight for the little children coming to the feet of Jesus. I get it. It's not fun to talk about. It's not easy to talk about. But I think we do ourselves a disservice if we skip over all of the hard scriptures and go for the feel-good verses. It is my hope today, as with every week, that we can find our hope in our faith and in our scripture, even the hard ones. Hear now the words of Matthew, I'm sorry, of Mark, chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. Some testing him asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. 
In the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. There's a charity in Macon. I'm sure there are similar ones here in our area called Crisis Line and Safe House of Central Georgia. That group serves women and children who are fleeing abusive relationships. They can call any time, day or night, and get help. They own a home somewhere in Macon that is a safe house for those families where their abusers cannot find them. They get many they get help on many fronts, including legal aid. My friend and attorney, Julia, has been on the board just about as long as it's been in existence. These women and Children that she helps are often afraid to leave their abusive situations because of their fear for their lives. The need for this service and the number of women and children that it saved over the years seems to be in direct contradiction from the letter of scripture in this passage. It may be an extreme example, but it is a very real one about how scripture can be seen as harmful. Does Jesus really intend for these women and children to stay in these situations? This is why it's hard to read this passage in Mark and the one in Matthew 5 without cringing a little. Because of hurtful and abusive situations, we tend to dismiss this passage and not really look to see what it is saying. We think surely we cannot apply these same standards to our world today. We just look at it from the surface and don't look at the complexity of the scripture. We do not really look at the intent of the words of Jesus. We just take them out and apply them to our world and social climate today and only look at them in one way. There are no cute Elvis letters out there about divorce to make us laugh as we get the bigger lesson. This is the hard work of faith, but I think work that deserves to be done. I think the main answer is in verses 2 through 5. Once again, we find that people are trying to test Jesus. So this passage is not just about divorce, but how Jesus interprets the laws as a whole. People have and will try all manner of questions to get Jesus to say something that will discredit him or worse. Today's question just happens to be about the law of divorce. Some testing him asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. The first thing that stands out to me is that the laws were written for the male-centric social climate of the time. Doesn't always seem that anything has changed on that front, even today. There were no laws that allowed women to leave their husbands in their abusive situations. There were laws that could be 
They could be given by their fathers to whomever their father saw fit. This law and his response were about the men of the time. Moses, Jesus tells these men, allowed divorce because the hardness of the men's hearts. We look at the rest of the passage. It's really Jesus' way of protecting women. It's calling to task these men who have been given the right to divorce their wives. It's saying to them, go back and look how God intended you to act and do that. He's not speaking to the wives in those verses, but the men that are using divorce to be able to be in the kind of relationship that is not spiritual or scriptural. Man is supposed to become one with his wife. They're supposed to not be able to be separated. But men of the time, by law, were able to toss their wives aside and get a new one. While women had very little protection under the law. It reminds me so much of the letter of Paul um, to the Ephesians. The one where everyone wants to quote Ephesians 5, 22 to, through 24. Wives, subject yourselves to your husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be, and everything to their husbands. Most people stop there, letting the men off the hook again. But then comes that pesky next section, the longer one, that reminds us why this Mark passage is important. Paul redeems himself a little and says this, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I am speaking about Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband is the golden rule for husbands. It's how we should all treat each other. This passage in Mark, I prayerfully and wholeheartedly believe, does not mean that people should stay in an abusive marriage. And I mean abuse of any kind. Women can be just as cruel and abusive as men can be. None of us have to withstand emotional, verbal, or physical abuse of any kind. Jesus, I believe, was not speaking about those specific issues, but about the greater abuse of the divorce law itself. Jesus protected those who were marginalized and abused. Jesus sought to protect those women and children that had no other way of protecting themselves. There are many passages that show that very thing. And just because he doesn't specifically speak to that topic in these verses does not mean he would want anyone, man or woman, to stay in a place where they were not safe. We're supposed to be tender to each other. Bruises from abuse are not always on the skin. They can be on the heart. They can be in our emotions and in our self-esteem. If you don't hear anything else today, beloved, if you are a survivor of any of those situations, this passage is not about you. For those who are trying to trip Jesus up that day, that's what they're hoping for. They were not looking for a condemnation of those who got divorced. 
but for a way to discredit Jesus. And as always, he did not let them. Mary Oliver may not have written this poem for those who need a fresh start in life, for those who could not find a man or a woman that was true to their word about becoming one flesh. But those words of hers speak to the reality of those who need to start over and save themselves through God's love and support to find their voice again so their light could shine. She says this at the end, but little by little, as you left their voice behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. Our Psalms passage today says this about leaving behind those people who are who do evil toward us. Just like the women and children at Crisis Line and Safe House continually to bravely do. For your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud the song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. It is that altar and table that we are welcome to come to today on this World Communion Sunday. No matter what state we are in, no matter how we got here, no matter if we are single or married or divorced, all of us are welcome. God will help us get rid of those who are wicked to us so we can sing aloud songs of thanksgiving at his table together. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope you heard that message today. I hope that you see the kind of love and relationship that God wants for each one of us. And I hope you see that Jesus and God want you protected and cared for tenderly and loved. Because in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.